Strong and Courageous, from the book of Joshua. Today, I'm presenting a message that I have entitled, An Altar Named Ed. I want to show hands about how many of you have ever heard a sermon on an altar named Ed. Very good. I hope that I will be able to teach all of you something. You've heard of a clock named Ben, a boy named Sue. This is an altar named Ed. All right? And I know you're thinking to yourself, where on earth is he going with this? I'm going to Joshua chapter 22. I have not put our sermon text on the screen because I want you to open your Bible. We've got one of those texts again like a couple weeks ago where I just need for you to kind of thumb through the pages of your Bible and pick up on the things that we are going to be uh, speaking about. He said that in Joshua chapter 13, the dividing up of the land begins. Remember, they're doling out the land to the various tribes. And in fact, chapter 13, chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16, chapter 17, chapter 18, chapter 19, chapter 20, chapter 21, all of those chapters are kind of a, a lesson in geography and a lesson in ancestry and we're parceling out the land to the various tribes and clans and families. After it's all said and done, we come to chapter 22. The land is all divided up. The battles have been fought. It's taken seven years to conquer the land of promise. The book of Joshua covers seven years chronologically. And we're now at the end of that seven year period. Um, you might remember from studying the Bible that there were actually three tribes, two and a half tribes, that received an inheritance before they ever actually got into the promised land and started to fight. And um, I want to, to have our map go up. Donnie, can you put up a map? There we go. Good, 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 good. This is the way that the 12 tribes are divided up. And I want to point out to you right here, if you'll follow my little laser dot, you'll notice that from this sea, called the Sea of Chinnerman, actually that's the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River flows south to the Dead Sea, which is this big, funny looking thing, looks like a like a sausage with a bite taken out of it, right? And this is the Sea of Galilee. You'll see that there's the, tri the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Gad, and part of the tribe of Manasseh received their inheritance on the east side of the Jordan River. The fighting has all taken place. It's now time for each tribe to go to their homeland and to settle in. And so these two and a half tribes are going to cross the Jordan River and go to the land that had been given to them. They got to thinking in the process. We're cut off from our brethren. And in fact, the Jordan River really was geographically quite imposing. It wasn't just the Jordan River, it was the mountains that immediately surrounded the Jordan River. And it really was cutting those two and a half tribes off from all of the rest of the children of Israel. And they got to thinking, you know, we need to do something in order to make sure that we remember that we're part of the nation of Israel. And we need to do something to make sure that the nation of Israel remembers that we are an important part of the nation. We read about this in Joshua chapter 22, verses 10 through 34. What they decided that they would do is they decided that they would build an altar. Our text says it's an imposing altar, a big altar. An altar just like the altar that existed where the rest of the nation of Israel 
was worshiping the altar of the tabernacle. They wanted something to remind them that they were part of Israel and to remind Israel that they were a part of, they were their brethren, even though they were geographically cut off. And so what they did, um, can you go back to my map? Very good. Right here where you see Jericho, not far on the one side of the Jordan River, on the Gad side of the Jordan River, they built this imposing altar. The other tribes of Israel heard about it. Now the Lord was very specific. There were to be no sacrifices made apart from the sacrifices made by the tribes of Levi, made by the tribe of Levi, the ordained priests of the nation of Israel. Anyone else who made an altar and offered sacrifices on it was clearly in violation of God's law. And so the other ten tribes got together and decided they were going to war. Because these two and a half tribes had built an altar, not the approved <coughs> altar. And there was this huge, huge misunderstanding. Well, thankfully, before they went to war, they sat down and talked. Always a nice thing before you go to war. And when they talked, they, the ten tribes said, what are you doing? Wasn't the sin of Achan enough? Wasn't the sin of our ancestors when they built a golden calf? Wasn't that enough for you? Didn't you learn a lesson? And they said, wait, wait, hold the phone. They didn't really say hold the phone, but you know what I mean. Hold, hold everything. We built this altar not to make a sacrifice. We built this altar to remind us that we're part of you. We were afraid that years from now, our children and our children's children and their children would be forgotten by your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. And we wanted this altar to be a witness that we're all part of God's family. We belong together. We weren't making sacrifices. And so rather than have a war, they kissed and hugged and made up and went home and everyone was happy. Isn't that wonderful? And in the 34th verse, the 34th verse, we read this. This is from the NIV. The Reubenites and the Gadites gave the altar this name, a witness between us that the Lord is God. Now, if you read this from the King James, and I really like the King James because it, it provides such an interesting look at things, the King James reads it this way, and the children of Reuben and the children of Gad called the altar Ed. <laughs> For it shall be a witness between us that the Lord is God. Yes, indeed, the altar was named Ed. And that's because the word Ed in Hebrew means witness. So they named the altar literally witness. Ed. Now, you will hopefully you'll leave this place and you'll never be able to forget that that altar was named Ed. Ed the altar. Alright? Now, I want to talk to you today about family unity and getting along in the family of God and in your own family. There are some wonderful lessons here about family unity and getting along. And I, I want for us to glean them. Let's take a look at verse 10 in your Bibles, in our text. Verse 10. And I want to just begin by making some observations about family unity. Family necessitates unity. If you're going to be a family, you have to have unity, or you're not really a family. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3 says, Be diligent to preserve the spirit of unity in the bond of peace. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 25, 
Every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. If a family is divided against itself, it will come to ruin. And Psalm 133, verse 1 says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. Friends, God has called us to be part of His family. And the fact that He's called us into a family, not a club, not just an organization, but a family, shows how very important it is for all of us to get along and dwell together in unity. I want to suggest to you that there is nothing that builds unity like worship. <coughs> worship builds unity. And hence, <coughs> the choice of the two and a half tribes to build a replica of the altar. Now they could have built replicas of other things. I suppose they could have raised some huge stone and inscribed the Ten Commandments on it, couldn't they? There were symbols, I'm sure, that they could have erected, but instead what they chose to put up was a replica of the altar. Why? Because the altar, more than anything, speaks of worship. And worship binds people together. It builds unity. Notice it says they built an imposing altar there by the Jordan. It wasn't just a, an altar, a little replica. It was probably overscale. It was large and in charge. The altar ed. That they could remember that they were part of the same family. A family that worshipped the, the same God. I want to suggest to you that we are God's family, and there's a lot about us that's different. Some of us are more different than others, and that's okay. In fact, it's the Lord's genius that we can be so different and yet a part of the same family. You know that? I mean, if you just start looking around, <coughs> And thinking about the age and education and economic differences and racial differences and all the things that we don't have in common. Who but the Lord God could put us all together and make it work? And it's a wonderful thing. You know, when we come to be part of the Lord's family, we're not called to be clothes. He doesn't call us to be just like everyone else. No, we're different. And really, the, the family of God is, is a celebration of those differences. But there's important things that we have in common. And the most important thing that we have in common is the worship of our God. That's what binds us together. That's what makes me your brother. Even though you root for the Reds and I loyally root for the Cubs. We look different. We feel differently about things. But our differences aren't as big as the similarity that we share because we worship the same God. That's what makes us one. We have the same Savior. The same Lord has shed His blood for you and for me. And I want to suggest to you today, this is why corporate worship is so important. Can you worship God out fishing for bass? Yeah, you can. Can you worship God while you walk the greens? Yeah, you can. But you can't be with your family as a family in worship and do those things. That's why corporate worship is so important. We recognize that what we have in common glues us together as family. I want to shift from here and I want to talk about family fights. Because you know what? Family doesn't always get along. I know this comes as a shock to you. I'll tell you what. It's better now, but I, I tell you, about four or five years ago, when my mother still lived 
and before. She always used to ask me, how come you don't come see me? And I would say, mother, you want me to put my wife and my three kids in a minivan and drive 24 hours to see you? That just won't work. Why? Because the Nichols family does not do well in closed places for long periods of time. Oh my. Anybody hear me with that? Huh? Amen to that. Yeah. Got a little teenager. Yeah, amen. To that. <laughs> hey, you know, sometimes the family just doesn't get along. Well, I want to ask a question. It's this. Is there anything worth fighting over? <coughs> is there anything worth fighting over? Verse 11 and 12 of our text says, When the Israelites heard that they had built the altar on the border of Canaan at Gileath, near the Jordan on the Israelite side, the whole assembly of Israel gathered at Shiloh to go to war against them. Is there anything worth fighting for? You see, the ten tribes fell that the true worship of the true God was being threatened. They felt that what was taking place was nothing short of an affront to the worship of their God, their Creator, their God. What about it? What do we hold so dear that we would fight for it? Now, some people would say, well, you know, Ken, the most important thing is peace. And I would say, no. The most important thing is not peace. I love peace. I, and, I, and I'm going to do a little bit. We're going to talk about how important peace is and how to achieve that. The most important peace in God's family, the most important peace even in your own household, or the most important thing even in your own household is not necessarily peace. Peace is a good thing, but it's not number one on God's list of priorities. You know, in the context of the church, most church fights are over really stupid things. Did you know that? We don't like selling so and so. So and so said this and that to me, and I'll never talk to her again. And now, this is no joke. I, I preached in a church in, in southern Missouri. Not far from where I was, there were two Christian churches virtually on top of one another. The reason that they existed was this. One lady, they were at one time they were one church. But what happened was uh, two neighbors, both members of the church, lived side by side. One lady had a goose. The other lady lived right, right beside her. This lady let her goose run wild. The goose, no joke, went next door, laid the egg, laid an egg on the property of this other lady. The lady said, my yard, my egg. The other lady said, my goose, my egg. And so two churches, I'm serious, two churches were formed. My yard, my egg. My goose, my egg. Okay, they weren't called my yard, my yard, my egg, Christian church. <laughs> my goose, my egg, Christian church. But they might as well have been. You know what? That's just foolishness. And it, it shames the name of our Savior when we fight over such things. And you know what? There are some things that I'd be willing to fight over. You know, <coughs> salvation through Jesus Christ and through Christ alone is worth fighting for. And I wouldn't want to be a part of a church where that, where that wasn't taught to believe. How about the Bible as the only rule of faith and practice? How about the Bible as the perfect, infallible, inerrant word of God? See, there are really some things worth fighting over. We generally don't fight over this trivial stuff. Verses 14 through 16. I call this section, Can We Talk? Can we talk? Verse 15 says, They spoke with them. Novel idea. 
before a holy war is declared, the sons of Israel first sat down and they discussed matters. Now they were ready to go to war. But they, somebody with a clear mind said, you know, before we attack, before we actually go to war, maybe we should send someone to talk and just make sure that this really is the way that it appears. And wouldn't you know, as they talked, as they discussed, they found out that it wasn't as they had supposed. It was three, it was 180 degrees the opposite. The very thing that they thought those two and a half tribes were doing was the very opposite thing of what they intended. And they talked. Folks, if you have a problem with a brother or sister in Christ, you owe it to them and to the body of Christ to talk to them. To go to them and have an adult, Christian, brother to brother, brother to sister, sister to sister, conversation. Like big people do. You know? God wants us to communicate. And then verses 17 through 20. Your sin or ours? They make this interesting observation in the process of kind of getting carried away, but I think it's a good observation nevertheless, and it draws us back to a lesson that we learned, we learned early on in the book of Joshua. They said, listen, don't you remember Achan? That when he sinned, it hurt not only he and his family, it hurt everyone in Israel. Do you want to do that to us? Is that what you're trying to do? Sin hurts everyone in God's family. If you decide that you will lay aside God's will for your life and just rebelliously live in contradiction to His will, you hurt not only yourself, you hurt the church of Jesus Christ. You just did Final point, preserving the unity. <coughs> Let me give you two or three positive steps that we can take to make sure that we preserve the unity in Christ's family. <coughs> Let me begin with this phrase, preserving the unity. We do not create unity. I've always found this very fascinating. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. Notice what Paul says. Be diligent to preserve the spirit of unity in the bond of peace. Unity is created by God. He calls upon his family to preserve it. We are not charged with creating unity. He's given us his son. He's cleansed us with the blood of Christ. He's called us into his family. He's made heaven our home. That makes us one. He's created all the unity that we need. Now our instruction is preserve that unity. We cannot create unity in the Lord's family. But we most certainly can kill it. example, the My Yard, My Egg Christian Church, or the My Goose, My Egg Christian Church. The Lord entrusts unity of His family with us, and He asks us to preserve it. How is it preserved? Well, sometimes it has to be preserved through loving confrontation. Loving Confrontation. You know, when you care about someone, really care about them, peace at any price is not enough. Sometimes when we care about someone, we have to go to them and say, look, what you're doing is wrong. Where you're at is not God's will. You're not walking with the Lord and it's going to hurt you and it's going to hurt us. We want to call you into accountability because we love you and care about you. 
our love will sometimes cause us to confront a situation. Let me say, Matthew chapter 18 gives us the methodology for addressing that situation. Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. Write it down. We won't go into it in our message. But it's very clear about how to approach someone. Now I want to close with this. We need to consider a person's motives. Consider a person's motives. It's important that we do our best to view things from God's perspective. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. What that means is that we shouldn't judge a book by its cover. All those trifle things that we sometimes say. What it means is that we need to care enough about a person that we say to ourselves, well, I know how it looks, but I really want to try my very best and discern this person's motives looking into their heart. To the ten tribes, it looked like the two and a half tribes had fallen off the deep end. But when they discerned their motives, guess what? Not only were they pleased with their motives, they decided they could name the altar in. That's not Mr. Dead, that's a horse. The altar's just dead. We need to carefully discern what's on a person's heart. And do our best. To help view them from the intent of their actions rather than the simple appearance <coughs> of what we perceive. I'm sure glad the Lord has made us say that. Um, you can't say really enough about family. And you know, you might be saying to yourself, you know, Ken, you might have had a great family, but I didn't have a great family. So I don't like all this family talk. I want to challenge that. Let me suggest this to you. And I'll close with this. You get three shots at family. The first shot at family is the family you grew up in. You have absolutely no choice about that. None. You get no choice whatsoever with your mom and dad were in the circumstances in which you grew up. You get and it might be that you really had a lot of family. Second choice, or the second shot of family you get is the family that you make. Most people marry and have children. That's the norm. We form relationships, we have family. And you know what? Sometimes that gets trashed by wrong choices we make or by wrong choices that other people make. But you know what? You get a third shot of family. The third shot of family is God's family. And he calls you into his family. And that's a family that won't ever get messed up. If you had a bad experience in your first family or in that second family that you thought you were born, you know what? God wants to be a loving Heavenly Father to you. And he's not going to mess up. And he wants you to be a part of his family, this family. And we're not perfect. We might fuss and fight every now and then, but we're God's man. And we want to work to preserve what God's given.